Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a few moments uh, as people are gradually joining us. Well, good morning again to everyone. I know that uh, participants this morning are still uh, joining us, uh, but I think we'll start the proceedings because we have a very full morning ahead of us. I'm Alba Smith, and I have the very real privilege of being chair of Women's Aid. I'm delighted to be moderating today's discussion. You know, I very strongly believe that creating spaces to share uh, information, to share insights, uh, not to mention new, innovative, exciting thinking is fundamental to bringing about positive social change. And I think everybody here this morning knows just how urgently that change is needed, and particularly in relation to issues of uh, violence against women. Thank you all for attending today. We have been really overwhelmed by the response uh, throughout the year of uh, people being so generous to, to women's aid. And I think that that's um, shown in the degree of interest we've had for this morning and also actually in the media coverage to date. We have a wide and very large audience, including obviously our own women's aid staff and volunteers and board members, staff from many other of the domestic violence refuges and the support services right across the country, survivors of domestic abuse, bereaved family members due to domestic homicide. We also have members of the Urchtus on Garda Siakona, the legal profession, staff from the Department of Justice and representatives from TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency. There are also staff, I'm delighted to say, from other organizations who support women and children affected by domestic violence like the Homelessness Services, children's organizations, medical and social work uh, professionals and others. And of course, members of the media who are also very welcome. I think this is an event which is going to be extremely informative and uh, really uh, signposting and, and providing a very important conversation about how we as a society respond to the issue of domestic violence in our country at the moment. This is actually, a, a, I think, a key moment following an extraordinarily challenging and very difficult year when I think we have an unusual, probably in a lifetime, unique opportunity, as well as an urgent need to reflect on the direction and choices open to us as a society, and specifically to achieve a deep understanding of the scourge of domestic violence and coercive control, and to uh, work more strongly and even more effectively um, to both prevent and combat that. We have a very impressive panel of speakers this morning, including Sarah Benson, who's the CEO of Women's Aid, Minister Hildegard Nocton, Dr. Adrian Barnett from Brunel University in London, Mary Louise Lynch, the founding member of CC, and Dr. Niall Muldoon, who is the Ombudsman for Children. And I just know that each speaker will be offering us very valuable perspectives on how to tackle the shocking levels of domestic violence uh, and abuse, the 43% increase that we have seen this year in calls to women's aid alone, and to address the very serious gap within the Irish family law uh, system. Now, as is usual in these um, current events, I have a couple of housekeeping points to make with you, if you bear with me. This, the webinar, I think, as you will understand, is being recorded 
and we will also be emailing you a link to that recording. We have, as I said, a very packed agenda to get through, but there will be some time for questions and answers at the end, and you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There'll be a member of staff keeping an eye on the comments and the questions as they come in and sort of fielding them over to me. And we'll get to pose, I hope, a number of these to the panelists before we finish. And can I ask you very particularly to use your hashtag on social media today? Our hashtag is hashtag annual impact 2020. And uh, I'm now going to move straight away with great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Sarah Benson. It's my pleasure to introduce Sarah, who has shown really remarkable leadership as CEO of Women's Aid, as the organization has been responding to this once in a lifetime challenge of the global pandemic. Sarah has led the fantastic team at Women's Aid to adapt and respond to women subjected to domestic violence and abuse during the lockdowns and the restrictions that we've all been dealing with for uh, well over a year now since March 2020. Sarah was one of the very first voices to sound the alarm and to express deep concern about the perfect storm of circumstances that meant that women and children living with domestic violence were at risk of more frequent and severe abuse. And I think her, her, her task today is to give us an overview of the contacts and the disclosures of abuse heard by frontline support workers um, and the work by Women's Aid in 2020 to bring about legal, social and systems change to create a better society for the one in four women in Ireland subjected to abuse. One in four women. Sarah, you are very welcome. Thank you so much, Alba, um, and a, a very, very warm welcome to my fellow speakers, whom we're honoured to have join us today for the launch of the Women's Aid Annual Report for 2020, and to discuss our spotlight focus for this year, which is on the family law system as experienced by women subjected to domestic abuse. Um, and thanks also to everybody who's logging in with us this morning. Alva has outlined the, the wonderful uh, mix of participants who are engaging with us today, uh, which is so important because the response to domestic abuse requires a multifaceted community uh, response. Uh, it requires the community and voluntary sector, the statutory sector, and indeed just all of us as um, citizens and uh, those living in this country. So. Um, I think one of the things uh, we hope today is that this will be a very informative session. It, it may be sobering and jarring also, but I hope ultimately it's, it's an optimistic um, session because there are real opportunities that we want to highlight uh, as solutions to the challenges that do face us. I also uh, want to just take a moment to acknowledge that there will be some in the audience uh, who are directly impacted personally by this issue. And I would encourage you um, if it is useful to you to reach out anytime to our National Free Phone Helpline, uh, day or night, um, if we can be support simply as a listening ear or to give you information or indeed direct you to uh, a, a service, a local service in your own community, or you can find out about your local services on either womensaid.ie or on the website safeireland.ie. So uh, some of you may have had a chance to view the report, which we are launching today, um, but if not, just to say that you can download it after this session. It's now live on our website, or you can find the link through uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So you can read about all the areas of our work, uh, including our training services, public campaigns, advocacy, as well as our frontline work, um, which will be our primary focus for the webinar this morning. I do want to take the opportunity to say how personally uh, very, very proud I am of the work of the Women's Aid team, including our incredible volunteers and board members uh, for the organization's achievements in 2020. When COVID hit, we had to immediately adapt our services to balance a hybrid um, of telephone support and information while retaining face-to-face -face supports for women at high risk of serious harm. We prioritised the raising of public awareness and concern from the outset, 
uh, developed and delivered campaigns and uh, importantly collaborated with many other key stakeholders to ensure the experience of those suffering domestic abuse were not forgotten. We pivoted our specialist training to an online format so that we uh, also adapted our power to change program for survivors to an online format so we could continue to deliver that. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank each and every member of our wonderful team because it is a team effort from uh, the person answering the reception phone to uh, the team uh, managing our accounts. It's, it's a, a whole team effort and uh, just to acknowledge that today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the outpouring of generosity to Women's Aid by our funders and donors who reached out to us at a time of real uncertainty as an organisation that needs to fundraise just over 50% of our operating costs every year. Uh, the groundswell of support was a lifeline in the early days of the pandemic to ensure that Women's Aid's vital services could adapt and continue to be available 24-7 through thick and thin uh, with women who were reaching out to us. And at the end of the year, we've also now been in a position to plan and develop a number of new strategic and innovative projects, which we mentioned in the report, so that we can try and do our best to have greater positive impact on women at risk of or subjected to abuse. So I'm going to kick off the focus for today uh, now with a short video, which just gives a snapshot of our impact and our activities during 2020. 2020 was a challenging year for women experiencing domestic violence. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant that many women have found themselves trapped in their homes with their abusers, at greater risk of digital abuse and unable to access support networks. Women's Aid have been on the front line responding to these new challenges and to increase demand for support during the pandemic. We focused public awareness on the specific plight of women subjected to domestic violence throughout this difficult time. We bore witness to the disclosure of thousands and thousands of coercive controlling tactics which form the pattern of domestic violence relationships, where abusers perpetrate a wide variety and combination of emotional, physical, economic and sexual abuses. Juliana is a young woman who accessed support from Women's Aid. I had a five minute phone call with Women's Aid and it was the first time I felt someone really took me seriously and understood what I was feeling and the damage that had been done to me. Women's Aid was able to advise me as to what I should do next, as well as give me legal information and psychological help. Emma is a service user on the High Risk Support Project, a support service to provide security to women at high risk of violence and abuse from their partners or ex-partners. She says... I would never have gotten away from him without the help I received. I'm forever grateful for the service. In 2020, Women's Aid conducted research on abuse experienced by young adults and found that one in five young women had been subjected to intimate relationship abuse, with a shocking 51% reporting that the abuse began when they were still minors. We ran our Two Into You campaign on Valentine's Day and again in November to raise awareness of this issue. This past year has shown some genuine progress in relation to combating domestic violence in Ireland. We have continued our advocacy calling for reform and resourcing of the family law court system. Women's Aid also helped to shape the Harassment, Harmful Communications and Related Offences Act 2020. Coco's Law, which created three new offences in relation to image-based sexual abuse and harmful communications. However, serious issues still remain. In 2020, 92 new service users were registered with our High Risk Support Project for Women, who remain at serious risk of violence after separation from their abusers. Our Femicide Watch shows that three women died violently in 2020. Refuges still don't have adequate capacity for women and children escaping abuse.
we also critically lack dedicated and nationally available follow on options for long term housing of women and children subjected to domestic abuse when they're ready to leave temporary refuge accommodation. 68% of the times when we call refuges on behalf of women, they reported that they were unfortunately at full capacity. More must be done to end domestic violence against women and children. 2020 has both revealed and exacerbated the extent of women's abuse in Ireland, but has also raised awareness and support from the public and our politicians and has further galvanised collaboration among all of us at the front line to respond together as best we can. Women's Aid will continue to do our part through our service provision, advocacy and education work to achieve an Ireland where every woman and child is safe from domestic violence. To truly realise this, we need a whole community effort. And so now, and for the foreseeable future, the prevention, combating and punishment of devastating, coercive, controlling abuse must remain high on everyone's agenda. Women's aid. Listening. Believing. Supporting. So again, even we found our own statistics shocking. Um, a 43% increase in the number of women reaching out to Women's Aid for support during the most difficult of years. It's quite staggering. And just to remind that the National Free Phone Helpline uh, and our Dublin-based services, those are our statistics. And the helpline also acts as a signpost to all of the other domestic and sexual violence services around the country. So we know that our numbers are really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, as Alva has said, and in the video, one in four women in their lifetime will experience abuse, one in five by the age of 25, in some cases for the first time in their, their earliest intimate relationships. So this is not an issue that is on the wane. It is something that we have to remain absolutely vigilant to. And behind each of these statistics that we talk about, these are women that we know. These are women in our families, in our circle of friends, in our workplaces, at the school gates. These are women who are trying to protect themselves and keep themselves and their children safe in the face of unrelenting and devastating abuse. Women disclosed to us that they had been beaten, and strangled, uh, they had been burnt, they had been raped, and they'd had their lives threatened. Um, they told us of being denied access to family income, to feed and clothe themselves and their children. They talked about being stalked and humiliated online. And the impacts of the abuse experienced by women are wide ranging and can be very long term. Women disclosed to our support workers that they had experienced broken bones and nerve damage but even more long-term, this constant fear and hypervigilance, having been completely isolated from family and friends, experiencing suicide ideation, experiencing job loss, poverty, and homelessness. And women also disclosed that they had been beaten during pregnancies, a time when for the vast majority, you know, uh, a loving um, and uh, uh, an happy time, unfortunately a high a time of increased high risk for those who are already in abusive relationships. Um, and in some cases, women had tragically lost their baby because of the abuse that they had been subjected to. And indeed, it is heartbreaking to listen to women describe their concern for their children who have witnessed and overheard the abuse perpetrated against themselves as well as incidents of direct emotional, physical and sexual abuse against the children themselves. In 2020, there were 5,948 disclosures of abuse against children and uh, made to women's aid, uh, including women being beaten, uh, sexual abuse, constant and degrading verbal abuse, being hurt when the abuser was trying to attack their mother and abuse or neglect during access visits. And the abuse of women and children post-separation is of particular concern to women's aid because unfortunately with the coercive controlling dynamics of domestic violence relationships, unfortunately the abuse does not often end when the relationship does. And our annual impact report includes a special spotlight on the family law system and its failure 
to adequately protect those at risk from domestic violence perpetrators. During 2020, 39% of people in contact with Women's Aid last year were looking for information, advocacy and referrals specifically for legal matters. Separating from a controlling and abusive partner is difficult and it is a time of heightened risk. 24% of the women contacting Women's Aid last year were experiencing abuse from a former partner. Many of these women have children and their abuser, um, sorry, children with their abuser and needed to access the courts in relation to children's matters. Both Women's Aid's own frontline experiences and national research shows that the Irish family law system fails many women and children who are separating from a domestic abuser. The process is prolonged, it is costly, it is disempowering. It often results in unsafe custody and access arrangements, which disregard the impact of domestic abuse, including coercive control on children and overlook the risk of their direct abuse and or exposure to domestic violence. The, safe, uh, sorry, the safety of the protective parent, usually the mother, is rarely, if ever, considered in custody and access hearings. We have a long history of the family law system letting women down who are subjected to domestic abuse, particularly in custody and access hearings. Women report that there is a silencing of their experience of abuse, the voice of the child critically is not heard and vindicated as it should be. There is a pro-contact culture that does not consider risk to both the non-abusing parent or the child and which benefits domestic abuse perpetrators. Our experience as published in our 2019 Sentencing Watch report, uh, we heard clear, consistent testimony from women that evidence of criminal proceedings against abusers uh, the, pre uh, the presence of domestic violence orders and other risks were often ignored in custody and access hearings as irrelevant, when in fact they should be front and centre in considering safe contact for children and the protective parent. This is dangerous and it really must be corrected. In some cases, women actually report to us the ways in which the court itself becomes a tool for an abuser who will relentlessly drag them back even for minor grievances as a pretext to continue to control and torment their former partners. Not uncommonly, women are being accused of concepts like parental alienation, while at the same time there is a failure to recognize and understand the coercive controlling abuse that she and the children are actually being subjected to. When the family law system dismisses women's and children's experiences of abuse and prioritizes the right to contact of abusive fathers over the safety of children, this can be utterly devastating. Mothers tell us that they can feel they're unable to protect their children and that they cannot truly escape even after leaving the abusive relationship. Today though, it's really important. We also want to acknowledge that there are opportunities at this moment in time to reform both the family and the criminal law systems. This presents Ireland with a chance to radically improve the experiences and outcomes of women and children going through the difficult and dangerous process of separating from an abuser. With the Family Justice Oversight Group working within the Department of Justice and the Family Courts Bill going through the Oireachtas, among a range of other important initiatives, including the current consultation on the drafting of the new uh, national strategy to combat domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. We have a great chance. Um, and what we must do as part of these opportunities is to embed an explicit recognition that domestic abuse, including coercive control and its impacts in family separation are a critical factor in all family law proceedings and not just those that relate to protective orders under the Domestic Violence Act. Training and awareness for all professionals and agencies involved in court proceedings and screenings for domestic abuse are also required, among another uh, range of recommendations which we set out in our report today. The system can and should help to act to break the coercive bond that is controlling women and children. And as a society, we need to listen to their voices and finally put safety first in family law. These longer term reforms are critical. However, uh, we would stress that there is an urgent need right now to strengthen 
an already under-resourced and overburdened family law system against an expected tsunami of cases which have been delayed due to COVID-19 restrictions. It seems always to be the case that family law is the poor relation when it comes to investment in our legal systems uh, above or below even the, the criminal courts and even the commercial courts. And this to us is inexplicable given the enormous impact that these courts have on the lives of so many. It's long past time for this to change and for the current welcome and promised investment in system and structural change to be prioritized because from our perspective, lives depend upon it. As we earlier noted in our video, we in Women's Aid will continue to strive to advocate on this and other critical issues to seek opportunities, to work in partnership and to innovate so that together as a society, we can do better for those one in four women in Ireland who need our solidarity at some point in their lives. And we look forward to working with all of you to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sarah, for, uh, for your presentation there, which of course is very sobering. Um, you know, it's very difficult to, even still after all these years, to listen particularly to the experiences of women without a real sense of the, you know, the awful devastation, the damage, the pain, and really, uh, a sense it, it just makes me weep. But at the same time, <coughs> I think it is right <coughs> and it is very, very important to focus on, on the progress <coughs> that is being made and which is encouraging. I think this nightmare year has served in some senses as a wake up call to the breadth and the extent and the horror of domestic violence. And I think that there is a determination to build on that. So it is my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, <coughs> excuse me, who is Minister of State Hildegard Nocton, TD, who has taken on a critical responsibility for civil and criminal justice while her colleague, Minister Helen McEntee, is on maternity leave. And I know that I speak for everybody here when we re-offer our congratulations to Minister McEntee on the arrival of her, 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 her little baby earlier, uh, sometime last year. Um, Minister Nocton is at a cabinet meeting this morning. I think that would be no surprise to, to people, but she does send her very sincere apologies and she has sent us a pre-recorded contribution to update us on the work of the government to create a justice system that really works for victims of domestic violence. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Minister Hildegard Nocton. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Sarah Benson and her team of staff and volunteers for inviting me to launch the Women's Aid Impact Report 2020. It's an honour for me and I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the invaluable work w Women's Aid has done for all of us over the past four decades and more. I'm aware that there are staff from other domestic violence refuges and support services from across the country in attendance. And I would also like to commend the important work that you all do. Your collective contribution not only shines a light on the often hidden consequences of domestic violence, but also provides vital support services to, to, to those that need them. A special word of welcome to survivors of domestic abuse who are attending today, as well as to family members sadly bereaved because of domestic homicide. The real people behind these tragic events must never be forgotten and continue to inspire our work. That work shares the same important goal to combat all forms of domestic violence against women and children. As Minister of State for Civil and Criminal Justice, I look forward to examining how the information presented today can be used to reinforce and inform our policies and legislation in this area. Each year, the Women's Aid Impact Report plays a vital role in, in, in illustrating the stark reality facing thousands of women and children subjected to domestic violence in this country. 
the headline figures in the impact report of 2020 are truly harrowing. 29,717 contacts to women's aid, during which 30,841 disclosures of abuse against women and children were made. Some 24,893 disclosures of domestic violence, including coercive control against women. Some 340 disclosures of rape made to the Women's Aid Helpline. When compared with figures from 2019, the impact of COVID-19 is laid bare through the increased demand. Behind each figure is a person, perhaps a family, and I know that each person who contacted Women's Aid was met with compassion, was listened to, was believed and was supported in their time of need. I want to thank you sincerely for that. I would also like to pay tribute to Sarah Benson and Christina Sherlock for the integral contribution that they made to, to the Still Here campaign. The success of that campaign was in no small part to the dedication that they and other organisations showed in working with my department to get an important message of support out to victims of domestic violence during the pandemic. Through Operation Fuishev, Angartha Siakana have helped many victims of domestic abuse throughout the pandemic and should be commended for their work. I am of course concerned about the issue of victims who sought Garda help through 999 calls but may not have been responded to. And I'm aware that the Commissioner is due before the Policing Authority this week. I understand that Angartha Siakona have prioritised the interests of victims as they deal with this issue. There are a number of important actions currently being taken by my department to ensure that we have a justice system that works for families. A family justice oversight group has been established to agree a high level vision and key medium and longer term objectives for the development of a national family justice system. This is in parallel with the establishment of a dedicated family court structure as envisaged by the forthcoming family court bill. As part of its work, a public consultation on the future of the family justice system was opened on our website and a dedicated consultation with children and young people will commence later this year. As I mentioned, a family court bill is currently being drafted and its enactment will be a key element in the development of a more efficient and user-friendly family court system. This will be a system that puts families at the centre of its activities, provides access to specialist support and encourages the use of alternative dispute, dispute resolution in family law proceedings. Alongside this, there's another important area of ongoing work which will help us restructure and redesign how we engage with and support victims of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. The work to implement all of the recommendations of the O'Malley Report, as set out in Supporting a Victim's Journey, continues to be a priority. Already a number of important recommendations have been implemented, including the nationwide rollout of the DPSUs and the recent enactment of the Criminal Procedure Act, which introduces preliminary trial hearings for the first time in Irish law. Many more are close to completion, including the exercise to map the victim's journey so that we can identify where there are gaps in service provision. In addition, I expect to receive the report of the audit of how responsibility for domestic, sexual and gender-based violence is segmented across different, different government agencies shortly. And I understand that the review of emergency accommodation needs undertaken by TUSLA is also close to being completed. This work will, in turn, feed into the development of the next national strategy on preventing domestic, sexual and gender-based violence, which is to be published before the end of this year. The new strategy will have a focus on prevention and reduction. I recently launched the public consultations on developing the next national strategy and would encourage everyone at this virtual launch to consider taking part if you've not done so already. 
your expert and intimate knowledge of this subject should play a key role in developing the new strategy. I'm very conscious that we must do everything we can to ensure that those affected by domestic violence have a criminal justice system that supports and protects them on every step of a challenging journey. These are not meaningless platitudes, but priorities for my department. We have started this important reforming work, but I know we have some way to go before we have a system that from end to end places victims at its centre. As we continue our work, the input we receive from Women's Aid and our other partner organisations is crucial in helping us identify the changes we need to make. We want to ensure that those who engage with the system are treated with respect, dignity and empathy by everyone who they come into contact with. And I know that respect, dignity and empathy are the cornerstone of what Women's Aid does. My sincere thanks to you for this important work, which is so evident from your annual report, which I'm delighted to have been asked to launch today. Well, my thanks to uh, Minister Nocton for her um, very, I think, encouraging words and also for um, the tributes that she paid to Women's Aid and to all of the domestic violence services and um, refuges and responses really throughout the country. And of course, it is very uh, important and very good and positive for us to hear that there is a real sense of a reconfiguring and a resetting of priorities ongoing at the moment in the Department of Justice and indeed um, connecting, of course, with other relevant uh, the departments. And there is no doubt that the strategic um, planning process, which is currently in place for the, nas the national strategy, is a very important one that I know all here will be um, doing their very best to engage with very fully. So our thanks again to uh, Minister Nocton. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Adrian Barnett, our next speaker. Adrian is a senior lecturer in law at Brunel University in London. And prior to commencing um, as a full-time academic at Brunel in 2014, Adrian practiced as a barrister in London for over 30 years, specializing in family law. Her specialist area of research is domestic abuse in private family law cases, on which she's published and presented very widely in um, England and Wales and internationally for uh, the past two decades. Uh, most recently, she's been researching parental alienation um, in England and Wales and was commissioned to prepare the literature review for the Ministry of Justice's 2019 inquiry into risks of harm in family court proceedings, which was published uh, this time last year. And she is supporting the UK government's implementation plans. I think that her insights will be particularly important and valuable for us, given the current opportunities for reform that are happening in Ireland at the moment, as we just heard um, outlined by Hildegard Nocton. So I'm very happy um, to introduce Dr. Adrian Barnett. Adrian. Thank you very much, Alva. And uh, thank you so much, um, Women's Aid Ireland, uh, for inviting me uh, to the launch of uh, your incredible and really powerful uh, report. Um, it's amazing to see the work that, that you've been doing um, for uh, victim survivors of domestic abuse um, and, and how much more there, there is to do. Um, I'm going to um, now share my screen uh, with uh, my presentation today. Um, and let me just... Um, so, um, I'm going to be talking about um, how uh, parental alienation plays out in the family courts, uh, focusing primarily on England and Wales, uh, as that's where I conducted my small scale study, um, although the experiences in England and Wales um, resonate 
in many jurisdictions. So um, let me just move on. Um, so there are very few um, uh, empirical studies um, of parental alienation in the family courts uh, in England and Wales um, and in many other jurisdictions and certainly no generalizable studies. Um, so, um, and also apart from the Ministry of Justice Harm Panel report, the evidence that's available is a little out of date. Um, so what evidence is there? Um, my own uh, small scale study, which was published uh, in January, 2020, um, comprised a review of the case law within its historical and social context. Um, and I found a total, uh, a small number, a total of 40 cases contained in 54 judgments uh, from a review of the family law reports and Bailey covering the period 2000 when parental alienation syndrome was first mentioned in the reported cases to March, 2019. Um, now, of course, you know, the reported and published cases can't provide a representative sample of all parental alienation cases dealt with by the lower courts. Um, but they provide us with some insight into the way in which some trial judges respond to parental alienation and into the attitudes and responses of the higher courts. Um, I'm also going to draw um, on some updating information from a uh, workshop held in January 2020 at Brunel University, which included 20 lawyers, academics, child welfare professionals, and representatives of stakeholder groups. Uh, this study by Birchall and Chowdhury, What About My Right Not To Be Abused, didn't set out to investigate parental alienation, but many of the women they surveyed and interviewed raised it un unprompted. Uh, the most recent data is from the harm panel report, assessing risk of harm to children and parents in private law children cases. Uh, the Ministry of Justice call for evidence received um, well over a thousand usable responses from individuals and organizations across England and Wales. And they obtained numerous accounts of the problematic use of parental alienation. And finally, I'll refer to a few international studies that raise similar themes. So the main themes that emerge, and of course, this is a huge topic, but with respect to how parental alienation plays out in the family courts, um, the main themes that emerged uh, from the various sources are firstly, the prevalence of parental alienation, how parental alienation is understood by courts and professionals, um, the issue of parental alienation and domestic abuse, the best interests of the child, uh, the wishes and feelings of the child, and finally, transfers of residence. So first of all, the prevalence of parental alienation. Um, uh, there is no empirical evidence available on the prevalence of allegations or findings of parental alienation in the family courts in England and Wales and many other jurisdictions. Um, as I'd said, my review of the case law found very few reported uh, or published judgments, and the study by Doughty and others with Kafkas Cymru found even fewer. Um, however, my case law analysis did find an increase in reported cases from 2017, um, and a cursory review of the reported judgments since March 2019 found significantly more. The workshop at Brunel, the harm panel report, and anecdotal evidence, including some recent online surveys, indicate that in recent years, claims of parental alienation have become a pr prolific in the family courts. In fact, a lawyer at the workshop said that it was raised in nearly every private law case in which she was instructed. So how is parental alienation understood? by the courts. There is no official or commonly accepted definition of parental alienation, and there are a wide range of views on what it is and how to identify it. Um, 
There's also a lack of consistency in how the courts interpret and define parental alienation, which as Matthew Richardson, a barrister um, in this article pointed out, uh, can lead to a great deal of operating at cross purposes. Um, indeed, uh, Suzanne Zakur in her 2018 Quebec study uh, concluded that parental alienation, quotes, can mean whatever the judge wants it to mean. Uh, and uh, Liz Sheehy and Simon Lapierre observed that parental alienation is used so broadly as to designate any situation where a parent is perceived as engaging in strategies to exclude the other parent, regardless of whether the child actually rejects the other parent. Um, and I thought that this um, observation by Sandra Burns um, in her early study in Australia on parental alienation syndrome is, is quite insightful. She said that parental alienation means different things to different people and each meaning has an associated narrative, a story about its meaning, its existence, and the role it plays or ought to play in parenting disputes in the family court. And I think we can certainly see all those different um, narratives and stories in, in recent years. Now, a uh, huge issue that emerged um, from my study uh, and the various other uh, cases nationally and internationally, is the issue of parental alienation and domestic abuse. Um, my study found high levels of domestic abuse in cases in which parental alienation is raised, ranging from 50% to 80% um, at different time periods. Um, this was also reported at the um, workshop at Brunel and has been found in studies undertaken in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, and Italy. Um, what can also be seen is the way in which um, domestic abuse may be minimized and sidelined. Um, and in England and Wales, a minimal application of the main practice direction that applies in the um, private law cases involving domestic abuse, practice direction 12J, which leads to a focus on parental alienation rather than on domestic abuse. Uh, the, um, a number of, of sources, the uh, Birchall and Chowdhury study, the harm panel report, um, also highlighted the way in which victim survivors of domestic abuse may be even discouraged from raising domestic abuse for fear of being accused of parental alienation, um, uh, as this mother um, in the quote here reported to um, the harm panel inquiry. And similar findings have been made in the US, Canadian and Australian research. Uh, Joan uh, Mayer um, conducted the largest study on parental alienation uh, in the uh, national U uh, US empirical study. She identified and analyzed 4,338 4, judgments uh, and found that when mothers claimed abuse and fathers cross-claimed parental alienation, courts were more than twice as likely to disbelieve mothers' claims than if fathers had made no parental alienation claim. Liz Sheehy and Susan Boyd, uh, analysis of Canadian reported judgments published in 2020, found that judges were more likely to focus on alienating behaviors than on domestic abuse and that domestic abuse was rarely condemned uh, or related to children's best interests in the way that alienation was. Um, of course, at the heart of proceedings is or should be the best interests of the, of the child. Um, but a number of studies have found, including my, uh, my own small scale study, how um, the best interests of the child analysis can be distorted by the way in which parental alienation can dominate cases and can reduce the complex lives, emotions and circumstances of children and parents before the family courts to the single issue of alienation. Uh, as uh, Bryony Palmer, a barrister, um, observed in this quote, as soon as a parent is diagnosed as alienating and implacable, or indeed relentless and failing to listen, 
the every action or inaction tends to be viewed wholly through that prison. And it's that parent and their um, actions that are put under the microscope, perhaps rather than the child. Uh, this can lead to diverting a scrutiny um, of parenting practices and parent-child relationships, and can also mean that plausible explanations for children's resistance to parental conduct, contact may be ignored or overlooked. Uh, and in this way, we can see the way in which parental alienation is both underpinned by and re can reinforce the pro-contact culture. Um, and that leads us on to the, the, the wishes and feelings of the child. Um, uh, and the way in which parental alienation uh, can work to silence children's voices uh, and result in practices that are contrary to internationally recognized rights of children embodied in Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, it's fair to say that in my study, some judges took children's wishes and feelings extremely seriously. Um, however, others tended to ignore children's expressed wishes and feelings by filtering them through discourses of parental alienation. Um, the um, uh, participants in the um, workshop at Brunel, as well as professional respondents to the harm panel report, um, uh, raised concerns about the way in which children's voices not being heard and their experiences not being understood can increase children's powerlessness and can actually impede work in helping children to harm. Um, and they advised how harmful it is for children to be encouraged to disregard their own fear and distress or to be told that their experiences aren't real or they'll get over it or get used to it. Uh, Professionals uh, uh, and other participants who responded to the harm panel inquiry um, also reported that professionals may be too ready to see signs of alienation rather than to listen to children and hear their voices. Uh, and this um, uh, participant from the Family Justice Young People's Board uh, who participated in the um, focus group for the MOJ inquiry um, shows graphically in this, in this quotation um, how not being able to raise what was happening to them during five years of contact with their father um, because they were so concerned about the effect it would have on them and their family left them very alone, very isolated, not able to talk to anybody uh, or seek support for their experiences. And then finally, um, the issue of transfers of residents. Um, although there were very few transfers of residents in the, the case law that I reviewed, um, the harm panel report and other anecdotal accounts suggest that um, these are increasing. Um, and in particular, um, increasing um, when rec recommended by um, parental alienation experts. Um, the case law uh, indicates uh, an, an increasing number of parental alienation experts from about 2017 being instructed in family court proceedings. Um, concerns have been expressed um, uh, that once an expert is instructed, they invariably um, diagnose parental alienation and um, may recommend changes of residence. Uh, the harm panel report raised concerns about the credentials of some experts and whether these are sufficiently scrutinized by the courts. Uh, as far as outcomes are concerned, these uh, don't necessarily reveal the benefits for children. Um, there are, uh, however, um, there is no research on outcomes for children of, of uh, particularly forced transfers of residence Although Joanna Silberg and Stephanie Dallum published a, a study in the US on turned around cases, uh, which I can uh, explain a bit more um, during the, uh, the Q&A when there's more time. Um, uh, and then finally, it may be um, uh, episode to point out that uh, Joan Mayer's uh, large scale US study found that in cases where mothers claimed abuse, fathers parental alienation claims 
roughly doubled mothers' rates of losing custody. Um, and their rates of losing custody increased to 73% when parental alienation was um, credited by the court. Uh, and then just finally, I'll explain what this picture is. Um, this was a picture taken at the Family Bridges reunification camp um, in the United States. And the children who were taken to this camp to be reunified with the target parent um, were asked at the end of their um, uh, program uh, to um, get together and draw a nice picture of their experiences and, uh, and um, uh, what the program had meant for them. Um, and this is what they came up with. Uh, so thank you very much for listening uh, uh, and um, thank you again for inviting me to um, speak at this important conference. Well, thank you very much, um, Adrian, for a very fascinating contribution. And I think that you showed uh, admirable brevity and succinctness in really uh, explaining, analysing for us the complexity of uh, parental alienation in terms of its meanings, but also highlighting the highly detrimental negative impacts for, uh, for women and their children in so many instances. So I hope that we will have some time to come back and talk about some more of that in detail. But thank you so much. I will now... Um, uh, introduce our next speaker, who is Mary Louise Lynch, and it's a pleasure, Mary Louise, to have you with us today. Mary Louise is the founder of CC, Survivors Eliminating Intimate um, Abuse Together. She herself survived years of abuse while trying to navigate the systems in Ireland, and she tried many paths to education and temporary employment while she was living with the devastation of ongoing coercive control. But she was not to be defeated, and very bravely, after realising that there was no one coming to save her, she set about learning how abusers so easily can manipulate the state and its processes, putting the spotlight on victims. And of course, we just really heard the, a very primary example of that in Adrian's presentation. Now, Mary Louise is seeking to build a better system and she brings the real life experiences of women who've had to negotiate with the family law system to, um, uh, she's going to talk about that with us today. I should say that she has a very impressive academic uh, background and not least is currently an MA, uh, studying for an MA in women's studies. You're very welcome, Mary Louise. Thank you, Alva. Um, I certainly feel like I'm in great company today. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here, um, even though I do feel like I'm breaking the rules. Um, so CC is a collective of women standing together against abuse. Our mission is to support women survivors out of isolation and to be recognised as experts by experience. Through mentorship, storytelling uh, and collaborative action, we are creating leaders to inform and influence the policy, legal, social and cultural reform required to eliminate intimate abuse in Ireland. We do this by networking and gathering survivors who are experts by shared experiences of surviving abuse and harvesting the learning from our journeys. We reach out to women in isolation to deliver a life-changing education and awareness program. We build on transferable skills to create a strong team of experts by experience. Our members are the bread and butter of the family courts, and we have had our human rights trampled on, and in some cases removed by questionable practice, procedure and legal decisions. Overcoming barriers to progress caused by abuse is a deeply personal experience, and explaining ourselves becomes a soul-destroying hazard on the road to recovery. How can we recover when talking about our being abused through the court system is considered a criminal act? How are we to recover when it may take months of setback to overcome the trauma caused by one day in court? Never mind years. 
Reparation should link individual reparation with structural transformation as defined by the Victims Directive. I'm only here today because I am a disobedient woman. And I can really only tell you about the lengths I went to in order to stay afloat. I moved to West Cork with my husband and children whom love me dearly despite the damage. I love my children and my husband, but their love could not stop the pain and helplessness I felt while the past continued to chase me. In 2016, while on Camino, the year after my father died, I had an epiphany. I realised there was no one coming to save me. And this is where the story of CC begins. Our founding members met and gathered in safe spaces like this one and at important events. To everyone at Safe Ireland, past and present, thank you. To West Cork Women Against Violence, thank you for not telling me I cannot be useful because I am still in it, as so many have kindly fobbed me off with over the years. Thank you for seeing and elevating the survivor in me. In 2018, I was appointed to the Board of West Cork Women Against Violence, and yet I am still supported by the incredible staff there when necessary. That has been a transformational opportunity. Sarah, thank you to Women's Aid. Um, I hope that what I say here today will help women in the shadows to believe that we have their backs and we are trying to change the rules so they are no longer forced to choose between protecting their children or breaking the law. Thank you to CC's wonderful board, you have done the impossible. With their help, CC has created a space to allow survivors to strengthen together and transform our own lives through self-determination. Many survivors want to speak out and would like their stories to contribute to improved outcomes for others. In turn, by elevating survivors, we are holding perpetrators accountable, spotlighting the beliefs and behaviours that uphold gender inequality. Investing directly in women survivors is long overdue. For too long now, the focus has been on perpetrators while leaving their victims isolated and marginalised. The unintended gift of COVID has been to uncover the extent of intimate partner abuse and highlight the plight of those setting out on the marathon leave to freedom. Now in this great time of innovation to overcome one pandemic, women survivors have overcome another to network, support and learn from one another and work together for change. Already our members are taking part in education and awareness training to become facilitators of programmes for women exiting abuse spurred on by each other's bravery. I'm not allowed to tell you if or how many times I have been in court. For if any of us were to share the number of days, weeks, months or years we have been at the mercy of the Irish legal system, we might be treated as criminals. We have been raped every which way, stalked, assaulted, strangled, beaten with fists, beaten with weapons, spat at, kicked, stalked, had property damaged, property stolen, money stolen, debts ran up, spied upon, had fraudulent loans taken out on us, threatened with suicide, threatened with murder, watched people we love be abused and threatened all because the man was losing control. Some of us are gone. Our members have had malicious reports made endlessly to social workers. Our homes are open to invasion from the state at any time. Should we just submit? We have also been told that we are overreacting, stuck in the past, making mountains out of molehills. We have been told to put all that behind you and focus on parenting. Some might stay, say we are stuck in our trauma. We have been trapped here, not just by some men's actions, but by all those who are groomed by or collude with abusive men and excuse their actions. In 1939, an addition to the 1937 Constitution meant that all court hearings regarding the state would be held in secret. And at that time, it was decided that the family under state came under state responsibility and all legal matters regarding families and children should be held in secret too. Times have changed and levels of abuse have mushroomed. Nowadays in secret, we have psychotherapists delivering a systemic family model and training judges to believe that children reporting abuse is child abuse. This is a global issue and an Irish problem. If a child discloses abuse and a mother makes appropriate referrals, 
and seeks intervention, and a child is seen by specialist interviewers, we have court-appointed experts working in our systems today that will make findings of abuse in reports against mothers for having their children interviewed. Some experts claim that the sexual abuse is not damaging, but the drawing attention to it and allowing the child to be interviewed or resisting contact with the perpetrator of abuse is actually what does the harm. We're told not to talk about our experiences of abuse at the hands of our children's fathers because it will negatively impact our children's relationships with their fathers. We are being held accountable for father's abuse and the impact of that abuse on mother-child bonds. It seems the intervening is perceived, it's, sorry, it seems the state is intervening in perceived harm and is ambivalent towards actual harm. We live with PTSD and a wide range of health adversities, increased levels of stress, vigilance, exhaustion, low self-esteem, self-criticism, bouts of endless guilt, eating disorders, substance abuse, fight, flight, flop, freeze. Is it all in our heads? Forget the abuse. Is it the reporting that's the problem? Our children are afraid and we cannot parent effectively whilst forced into dangerous contact. Our children's minds cannot be free while they are always on guard. As one child who has aged out of forced contact put it, I'm still afraid of him. Well, I'm still afraid, but he's not just at me constantly. He's not in my mind all the time like it was back then. What are children's views on having their voices heard? Some find it empowering, some uncomfortable, some are afraid to speak. Some, no matter how much they say, it is simply not heard. Some are called liars. Some are told they are too like their mothers. Some are asked over and over by expert after expert until they lose any respect they may once have had for adults who say they are there to help. We are told if the court process is draining our finances, go out and get a job. How is a survivor expected to do an ordinary job and go to court every few weeks or months and cope with PTSD that is triggered every time a perpetrator sets a new court date. Maybe in some sick way, it is a date. One woman in CC said, the only time I ever see him is in court. He has no other way to get to me. We are told that we are stuck in toxic relationships. We are not in the relationships anymore, but we are stuck there because the state won't let us leave. We are the women who might once have, ha have been put to work in laundries. These days, we are raked over coals in court. We tell our stories to some friends and they take a step back. Our truth makes people uncomfortable. More often, we are, we are met with what about her? The men, what about the men? I know this woman, she wouldn't let him see her kids and so on. Maybe well-intentioned as such concern is, it might just be collusion with an abuser. Everything that happens behind closed doors, including courtroom doors, is in secret. What is there to lose by opening them up just a little? Not so much as to leave vulnerable people exposed, but enough to stop the abuse. Haven't we moved on since 1939? We became part of the EU, we have divorce, we have marriage equality, we repeal the Eighth Amendment, recognizing a woman's right to bodily integrity. Brexit is done. We are preparing for an all island nation. We live in an era of technological super speed. What's the aversion to looking behind the in-camera? Why such resistance? We want effective case management implemented where families before the courts have opportunity to present evidence in a supported manner. We want specialist domestic violence guard liaisons available for all family law hearings in order to verify a survivor's contact journey. We are certain that all professionals working in the court system must be held accountable and we want accurate data of court hearings recorded. We insist all experts used in court proceedings to be bound by professional standards. We want to register a voice of the child experts and other associated professionals. And we want to have our concerns regarding current practices taken into account. 
some cases should be opened up for review and outcomes for families exiting the court system monitored. We are highlighting the damage done by the use of baseless theories linked to far-right extremism. We urge bravery from our government and legislature to make the necessary amendments. After all we have been through, it's the least the justice system can do. We're not here to be difficult. We want to live free lives and raise our families, but we need to be set free to do it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mary Louise. You know, that was just uh, very, very moving. And it's hard to talk so personally, I know, and you are very courageous. And I think your, you know, your, your call to the state to be brave is well made. Let them be as brave as you and the women that you're working with. And wouldn't it be a better day for the country as a whole? You said that times have changed. And I'm just thinking, indeed they have, when women who are survivors of abuse are up there on the front lines, pushing for change and pushing for an eradication of this terrible blight on women's lives and the lives of their children, that is domestic violence. So I, I'm up for you, Mary Louise, well done to you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll carry on now to um, our final speaker, who is Dr. Niall Muldoon, the Ombudsman for Children. I mean, I think it's a real sign of uh, how important this conversation today is, uh, that even when uh, Niall Muldoon couldn't realise he couldn't attend today's event, he sat down to record his contribution and to have his concerns for children in domestic violence situations, uh, to put that case very, very clearly. Uh, and indeed, the case they've made for a family justice service for uh, families impacted by abuse. Niall Baldoon has, as I think most of you will know, been Ireland's Ombudsman for Children since uh, 2015. He, is, um, he has a background as a clinical psychologist and has worked in the area of child protection for almost 20 years. As Ombudsman for Children, uh, Niall wants to see an Ireland, he says, where all children and young people are actively heard and respected so that they experience safe, fulfilling and happy everyday lives. Uh, we'll now hear uh, the video from um, Dr. Niall Muldoon. Good morning, everyone. I'm really sorry I can't be there live today but I'm really honoured to be invited to help launch the uh, annual impact report for Women's Aid. And I want to say thank you to Sarah Benson, the CEO, for inviting me to do so. Um, I really love the Irish playwright, Brian Friel, and one of his sayings that I quote often is that stories are the weapons of the dispossessed. And there's a couple of stories that stick with me throughout and six years completed as Amazon for Children in February due to do another six and two stories stick with me. One is of a little girl eight years of age who wrote to me maybe 2016 to tell me how sad she was to be homeless with her two siblings and her mother. And there wasn't an awful lot I could do about it, but I did invite the little girl and her mother to come in and meet me. And we met and we chatted and we found out, I found out how bright she was and what she loved Irish and how she loved her school. And as it turned out, her mother and herself and her siblings were um, moving around because of uh, domestic violence. They had to move 16 times within a period of two years. The mother was a bright, intelligent, articulate professional trying to maintain a job and keep the three children going. There wasn't a lot we could do. We referred her on to different agencies that they could help her, um, including the Mercy Law Resource Centre. And that, that was it. She went home with a bag of goodies from our office and was delighted. She wrote to me about a year later saying how, how great it was. Her mother wrote to me saying how great it was to be able to have her child heard. And it still made me sad that I couldn't do anything. And about two years ago, Christmas, I got a card from my mother with a home address saying, thank you very much for listening and for being involved. The children are going well and we've got our first home address in five years. But she also reminded me that 
she couldn't get on the new housing list because she was a co co mortgage holder with her partner. The second story was another young mother, um, late twenties, three children who I met in a, in a refuge, and she showed me around the room that she shared with the three children: two sets of bunk beds, two children, three children under five, one quite active, and how she was keeping it together. Keeping, she had to keep the kettle in somebody else's room so that the children didn't scald themselves because that's where they played. She had to put the mattress from her bunk bed onto the floor because that's where the, the active boy used to jump from the windowsill and from the top of things. And I just thought, why are we doing it? Why are we finding ourselves in these situations when there is a precedent for if, a, if somebody has alleged sexual offence, they're asked to move out of the house to keep the children safe. I don't understand why we would move the family, the mother, the children away from the place that is secure for them when we could move one person. Um, and that's just something I've I discussed it with various professionals in the, in the legal side, and it, you know, it's something I, I'll leave there for that. I won't go any further on it, but I just think it's an interesting concept that we're asking the people who need the most security to move to a place that is insecure, and it looks like there was bars in the windows when I met the, the mother in her refuge. And the children feel like they're prisoners and they've done something wrong. It doesn't seem to be child-centered focus. The second piece I want to talk about there is just the statistics that are in your report. The report that you'll hear about today, you know, talks about how you know we've seen every facet of child and family life affected since the pandemic. You know, in the Garda report, the surge last year since the pandemic had an increase of 41% between March and November last year. But your own figures, women's aid figures, say that 28% increase of disclosures of abuse against women and children, which includes a 24% increase of disclosures of abuse against children. Children at 5,925, just short of 6,000 children directly affected that you're aware of. That's a pandemic that we haven't heard about. That's a, a level of, of impact that is never clearly illustrated when we talk about domestic violence. People still allow themselves to think it's only the two adults that are involved, but there are so many children impacted. We really need to get on top of it. It's something we really, really make a difference on today. But we need to step up our, our response to domestic violence and to children within domestic violence. And that's something I, I want to speak about as well. I know today you're also going to be talking and highlighting within the report your Women's Aid's view on the family law system and how it treats mothers and fathers. And while there have been numerous campaigns and strategies to improve the child's experience of the court system and those dealing with domestic violence cases, it's clear, very clear, that much more needs to be done to address the additional challenges women in difficult circumstances who are fleeing abuse must face. Our office welcomed the general scheme of the Family Court Bill 2020 following decades of promise of reform and the neglect of the system. Family courts operate all around Ireland dealing with custody, domestic violence, divorce and child maintenance disputes. And we welcomed also the Department of Justice's establishment of a dedicated family justice oversight group last September to facilitate a coordinated approach to developing a national family justice system. And earlier this year, our submission to that group outlined an effort in an effort to improve what we felt was a poor system, the ways in which the court system fails women and children. In relation to that, I was disturbed by a report published by yourselves, uh, Bernardo Safe Ireland, the ISPC, CCC, and Daughters of Charity last year, a group you know, who came together to advocate for reform of the family justice system. That report found that abusive parents are routinely granted unsupervised access to children mother's concerns about child, child abuse are minimised and custody argument, arrangements which escalate domestic violence are ordered by the courts. It also found that some court appointed child welfare assessors are not sufficiently trained to deal with domestic violence and issues like that such as coercive control and may end up endangering children as a result. In complex cases the voice and the rights of the child are superseded by the rights of the parent. You can have a scenario where an abused mother may be asked by Tusla to leave their parent or their partner, but the other parent still maintains access rights, which allow them to see the child. This lack of joined up thinking can put the child at risk. 
And that's something we should not accept as a society. We need to find a better system. Why then do we go about looking to hear the voice of the child? Something we have promoted in our submission. The main reason is that if life altering decisions are made about you and somebody was to decide where you're going to live, who you're going to live with and who else you would meet while you were there, then you would want a say in that decision. It's no different for the child. They have a right to have their voice heard in decisions that are relevant to them. And there's no bigger decision relevant to them than where they live. It's important to stress that the child has the right to have their voice heard, but they're not obliged to speak if they don't want to. We need to keep that balance all the time. We have to think about the child's age, maturity, and individual needs. Because some children feel caught in the middle of two parents and they're afraid to pick sides. So they have the right to keep that silence if necessary, but they have to be offered the choice. No pressure of any kind can be placed on a child to express their views. Children need to be provided with timely, accessible information to support them to decide whether or not they wish to express their views. Where children do wish to express those views, they should have choices, including how they express them and when they express them and to whom they express them. That's the essence of a child-centered system. And I hope that's what we're gonna to move to in the new family law system. So when we allow a child to speak, that allows them to explain how they feel and what they're going through and what they would like to see happen for them and their siblings. Family breakdown is still quite stigmatized in Ireland because and children can very often blame themselves for what's happening. Children are, are self-centered. They think everything is about them. They think that anything good happens is through them and anything bad that happens is through them. We have to recognize that and help them to overcome that and realize that it's the adults that are at fault and a breakup is a breakup, it's nothing to do with them. In cases where a child wants to speak, we need to ensure that the process is as child friendly as possible. So whether it's by video link, whether we ensure we give them comfort breaks, there's an appointment with the gal perhaps, if that's necessary, providing an opportunity for a child to have some input on the decisions that affect them is something we need to be crucial in every court. On a slightly different angle, I just want to talk about a thing called Operation Encompass. I'd like to see a full implementation and rollout of this Operation Encompass, which was brought to my attention by Alcohol Action Ireland last year. And on the back of my understanding of it, I wrote to the Departments of Education, Department of Justice, and Department of Children, seeking for them to get behind the scheme as a result and as a follow-up to the rocketing of cases of domestic abuse. Children experiencing such home environments can feel shame, loneliness, mistrust, and they have no one to reach out to about their home life, and they're often asked to keep it a secret. Last year, Garda, Drew Harris, Garda Commission Drew Harris, who helped launch the, the report, showed that there was over 27,000 reports of domestic violence during the period of lockdown. And if implemented, Operation Encompass would allow Gardaí to warn a designated person in a school when a child has experienced or witnessed domestic violence in their home overnight. We know that children living through domestic violence can become withdrawn, disengaged, or start to act out while in school. So rather than a teacher having to guess why the child has suddenly changed their behaviour, these children would receive the support and help that they need. In England and Wales, where this Operation Encompass has been introduced, police contact specially trained teachers in a school within 24 hours have been called to deal with a case of domestic violence in homes where children are present. If you think about it, any situation in which a police officer attends your house is a traumatic event for a child. And if it also includes domestic violence, then it's important that the people who know about them and care about them understand that that's happened. They don't need to know any details. But if a teacher knows that an Operation Encompass situation occurred, they can keep an eye on the child. I want to repeat my calls for this to be implemented so that schools can become a sanctuary and children are no, not further isolated, misunderstood or neglected. So many teachers are dealing with this all the time in Ireland, but they don't understand what it is. They're hypothesizing what is wrong with the child and what can they do for the child. This would clarify everything, just a slight little bit of sharing of information. It's not something that's going to cost a lot of money, not that that should be an interest to anybody, 
It's a common sense approach that would lead to information sharing between the Gardaí and schools. The past 16 months have shown that schools are about so much more than education. They are a protective factor for many children and this system would be a no-brainer for schools to implement as far as I'm concerned. I want to sign off there and I want to congratulate Women's Aid on their report today and on the phenomenal work they did last year and this year in keeping domestic violence to the fore. I also want to offer thanks to the Gardaí for the work they've been doing to do that as well. Because from our point of view, the vulnerable children in those situations, being heard, having their calls listened to, knowing the Gardaí are there is a real help to supporting them. There's a lot more to be done. We hope the family law system will, will start to move in the right direction to make it easier for these children to get the security they want. For now, congratulations on your report. I wish you all the best for 2021. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Niall Muldoon for those very affecting and, of course, thoughtful uh, comments. And it really does occur to me that we are fortunate in this country to have such a powerful and uh, understanding person as uh, the advocate for, uh, as an advocate for children. Um, very important, um, obviously, in relation to all of the issues that we've been discussing today. Now, um, I uh, want to thank all of our panellists again for their very, uh, very informative inputs and to say that we do have a little time uh, for questions. We will probably run over by about five minutes, just to, to, to warn those of you. I know people have very tight deadlines, but just to give us a little space for uh, the questions. And thank you all very much, by the way, for uh, all your lovely, positive and supportive comments throughout the morning. And also for the questions, we don't, of course, have time for them all, but all of those questions uh, are being noted. So I'm going to start off with um, a first question, which will be, I think, for um, Dr. Barnett. Adrian, the uh, question says, it appears that there are cases in Spain and Italy where courts effectively dismissed parental alienation as uh, uh, concepts in custody and access hearings. Do you think a legal challenge to the misuse of this concept in DV cases would be a good strategy or not? And you know, as a follow on from that, how do we get the courts to refocus on coercive control in these cases? That's for Adrian. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, in Spain, in fact, there is legislation um, going through the uh, Catalan Parliament, I believe, uh, to prevent the use of um, uh, parental alienation concepts. Um, in private law children cases um, uh, because of its impact on domestic abuse. Um, the law, I think, was supposed to be implemented this month, and I'm not quite sure if it has yet. Um, in Italy, the um, Supreme Court in Italy um, gave a strong judgment uh, along the same lines. Um, of course, there are um, legal challenges uh, in individual cases um, to the use of parental alienation all the time in the family courts in England and Wales uh, and elsewhere. Um, uh, so um, that, that is something that w which I think that um, is increasingly being borne in mind. Um, but it, it, it needs, I, I think, um, to um, you know, further information to, to understand how it's operating. Um, as you're aware, for example, in England and Wales, there, there is a major overhaul um, in process as a result of the uh, Ministry of Justice Harm Panel report. Um, one of um, the components of which is to trial um, a, a, an investigative procedure in integrated domestic abuse courts. Um, and it's it's in that kind of context, I think, that um, a natural legal challenges to parental alienation um, would arise. Um, 
because it, it's, you know, a legal challenge on its own isn't perhaps going to um, be a, a, as effective a, a, as changing the culture, the deep-seated culture and ethos of the courts uh, to prioritize protection against domestic abuse. That's what's needed. And if that happens, then I think a, a lot will fall into place. But it's certainly something to think about, yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much, Adrian. I wish we had a little bit more time to explore that, but I will, in fact, move on to put a question uh, that has come in for Mary Louise. Um, Mary Louise, the questioner uh, asks, as an organisation of survivors, activists, whose experience has often been in the context of an in-camera legal system, how has the in-camera rule impacted on your work and do there need to be changes uh, in that? And I know you did refer to that during your, your talk. Um, yes, I, I think it's very important that if... Um, Current reforms that are underway at the moment are to have um, really meaningful input from survivors, that survivors have to be given permission to tell their stories, um, not to have everything, you know, disguised and filtered and collected by various data sets, which disaggregates everything. Um, you know, the, the, the Family Justice Oversight Committee recently sent out a um, uh, uh, a survey um, seeking survivors, uh, court service users experience of the court system. However, in that survey, um, individuals were reminded not to discuss anything that goes on in private family law proceedings as that is against the law. I mean, it seems like it's a tick box exercise if we're not going to make amendments and, and maybe it's legislative, maybe it's it's something quite simple, I don't know, I'm not the lawmaker, um, but we do need to be heard um, because what reaches the surface culturally is that, you know, terrible things are happening to innocent dads in the court structure and the reality on the ground is, is that families' lives are being destroyed long term um, and something as simple as allowing the storytelling could be very effective to change that. Yes, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I have a question for Sarah, which is in fact really two questions, Sarah. Um, first of all, do you consider that the very localized services for victims in their communities um, would help, uh, does that help to undermine uh, and highlight um, this issue? That was really, I, I think, quite a separate question from the second one. The questioner goes on also, how much is the housing crisis and the lack of alternative accommodation for women and children in crisis an issue for women's aid. So I leave you to link those two in your own inimitable way. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understand yeah. the direction of the first question, but I might home in on the second one. And, and uh, if, if whoever asked it wanted to follow up, I'd be very, very happy to give kind of more careful consideration to, to um, the substance of it. So not to, not to set it aside, but the, yeah. there was something that really struck me that uh, Dr. Muldoon said in relation to families who are um, being, you know, subjected to abuse within their own homes as to why it is the case that the, um, the person who is being abused and, and, and the children who may also be being abused or, or just by dint of witnessing the abuse are, are, uh, are suffering, why they are the ones who automatically it is expected would leave the home. Um, so in the first instance, I think we need to consider the strategies to provide and to ensure safe home protection. Um, we do know that we don't have enough uh, refuge spaces. That has long been the case. And, and our colleagues who uh, kind of have very resilient and determinedly continue to provide their services throughout the pandemic, having to do so with a dearth of, of places and having to accommodate um, social distancing, um, you know, have done remarkable work, but we're already, you know, uh, on the back foot in terms of uh, demand. But refuge isn't on its own a, a solution. So I think what has definitely emerged and with initiatives like the Tusla Accommodation Review, uh, which we hope will feed into the um, the very important work on the development of the new 
domestic and sexual violence uh, strategy must look at accommodation in the round, must give more visibility, in fact, explicit visibility to homeless through domestic abuse in the homeless strategy, where it isn't visible at all at the moment. Um, and so we need to have a, a, a fully uh, expansive uh, suite of responses where refuge isn't for everybody, where possible uh, women and children should be supported to stay safely in their own homes. If it's post separation, I know some of the things we've been in a position to do is even providing security around safe, uh, you know, security in homes. Uh, all of that needs to, to be a visible coherent strategy which it isn't at the moment so things like rent crisis and and stuff like that at the moment are acutely problematic and uh, accessing things like local authority lists again uh, the the ombudsman uh, explained why that is a problem in certain circumstances if you are tied um, because your name is on a lease or your name is on a deeds even if that home is not safe to be in that can cause barriers so I commend the work of our colleagues in, in Safe Ireland who drove initiatives like the rent allowance um, provision that was brought about for a temporary rent allowance without means testing for a period of months to allow somebody fleeing domestic violence to perhaps get temporary accommodation, enough time to just breathe because they're in trauma, um, you know, they're in perilous situations. It can be very hard. You need to gather the information on your rights, your entitlements and your next steps. Provisions like that need to be sustained after COVID-19 um, because there are very particular circumstances where domestic violence impacts on somebody's um, access to accommodation and they need to be um, uh, accommodated going forward. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And I mean, I think actually that the question and your response to that question sort of demonstrate that um, domestic violence and its impacts on women and their families, these are not in any sense marginal issues. They are and should be absolutely seen as uh, the very core and the very centre, at the centre of our social and economic policy, including housing and so many other services. But look, I want to again thank all our panellists for your wonderful for contributions. Um, I think that, you know, after such a, a nightmare of a year and the incredible work that has been put in by uh, Women's Aid and by all of the services and uh, the refuges around the country, it has been really uplifting, in fact, to have such an informative and inspiring and really encouraging future action reform uh, centre discussion conversation this morning really, I think, to galvanising all of us. I don't think it's possible for people working in this sector. I look at all of you and I wonder how you do what you do. It's not possible, I think, for you to work any harder, but hopefully it will give you um, a boost and that sense that what, what you do and what you do so magnificently well for so many women and children in great distress, um, that it will give you the boost to know that you are appreciated you are recognised, you are absolutely uh, essential and that we value you and the important advocacy work uh, you do. So it's my um, responsibility and also my pleasure as chair to say a very, very big thank you to Women's Aid for all that you have done over this really dreadful time um, to ensure that uh, we were there, that there was someone, that there was an organisation, that there were services, that there was, was refuge uh, for women uh, when they reached out at times of great distress for them. So a very big thank you to all our staff, to our CEO, to our volunteers who are so tremendous, and of course to um, and my fellow members of the board of directors and a big thank you to Christina Sherlock and her team for putting today uh, together. I would love to say more and to pay more tributes, but I will simply finish by saying a very big thank you to everybody who works in this sector and everybody who is connected with it, because we do, all of you, appreciate all of your work. And a thank you again to our wonderful audience for your lovely positive comments and all of your questions will have been uh, noted. So I'll say goodbye now and goodbye to our panellists and to everybody in Women's Aid.